my name is Esther Mayer Wagner. I am the executive director of the Wolf Institute, uh, which is an institute in Cambridge. And I'm also the editor in chief of the journal Al Masak. This is the copy, a copy of the journal Al Masak, which is the journal of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean, which is a very, very good journal. And it comes as a part of the subscription uh, uh, of the membership of the society. And I'll talk a little bit more about the society in a second. This is the ninth and uh, final webinar this academic year in a collaboration between the Wolf Institute and the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean. And we also have a few other partners on board. We have the CSIC IMF, we have the University of Liege and the Medieval Studies Research Group at the University of Lincoln. It's really exciting to see so many of you again in our webinar audience. Many of you have been to webinars before, but for those of you who haven't, I'll just say a few words about the Wolf Institute. The Wolf Institute is a research institution in Cambridge. We focus on religion and society, um, and uh, we combine our research with teaching, with publication and policy work. And we're also priding ourselves as a place where difficult conversations are being had. So please have a look at our website and our YouTube channel and uh, the social media to find more about the Wolf Institute. Now I'm going to swap hats and I'm going to talk about the society uh, for the medieval Mediterranean. The society was uh, founded in 1997 and it is dedicated to all aspects of the academic study of Mediterranean history and culture from the 5th to the 15th century. And uh, as I said, if you become a member of the society as part of the subscription, you will receive our beautiful journal, Emma Sack. Uh, so please do check out our website there as well, Society for the Medi Medieval Mediterranean. Now a very quick introduction of how this webinar works. We have a Zoom webinar audience here and we also are live streaming via Facebook. So if you want to re-watch this or if you want to recommend it to anyone, it's available from the Wolf Institute Facebook pages. And it's also very soon going up on YouTube so we can uh, check it out there. As for the structure, I'm going to introduce our chair today, Jessica Johnny Pierce, who's really the brains behind this webinar. Uh, Jessica and I, we went on a walk together on the weekend and uh, we got so excited about this upcoming webinar that we actually managed to mispronounce the word pilgrimage for quite some time. So I hope that that's going all right. <laughs> pilgrimage uh, is uh, our topic today. Uh, Jessica will introduce our very exciting lineup of speakers and we'll have short presentations and then we'll have a discussion where you can prepare questions for the Q&A session. Please um, type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen because it makes it easier for us to moderate the question through the uh, Q&A box rather than through the chat. So now it's my immense pleasure to introduce Jessica Tanner Pierce, who is a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Miriam. Just want to echo Miriam's uh, thanks to everyone who's attending. We're very pleased to host this panel today as the last event in our inaugural series of webinars. Um, before we begin that, I want to thank everyone who's attended one or more of our webinars this year, as well as all of our speakers in this series and our collaborators. It's been a delightful bonus of these terrible circumstances to be able to gather people who it would ordinarily be geographically challenging to have in one place for an evening seminar. In spite of the fact that we very much hope that the terrible circumstances are going to go away, we are going to continue this series next year with some more partners involved. We'll begin again in the autumn and we'll release details of the next season's program over the summer. Um, but now for today, as Miriam said, I'm going to introduce the speakers. Uh, I'll introduce them all at once and then they will speak in turn and then we will come to everybody's questions at the end. So if you, can, if you have questions throughout, please put them in the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So today our speakers are going to be addressing the subject, who are you calling a pilgrim? Christian, Jewish and Muslim travelers in the Eastern Mediterranean, 1100 to 1350. The first speaker is Philip Booth, who received his PhD from Lancaster in 2017 and has taught at various institutions, including the University of Birmingham and Nottingham Trent. He's now a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at Manchester Metropolitan University, working on a project focused on Holy Land pilgrimage at the time of the Crusades and the experiences of contemporary Christian, Muslim and Jewish travellers to the Holy Land. Our second speaker is Marcy Friedman, who received her PhD from the University of Manchester in 2016. She was most recently a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University in Chicago and is currently writing a book on the Jewish diaspora in the global Middle Ages, for the Cambridge Element series, The Global Middle Ages. And last but not least, our third speaker, Harry Munt, is senior lecturer in medieval history at the University of York 
He works on history writing and ideas about pilgrimage and holy places in the medieval Islamic world and is the author of The Holy City of Medina, Sacred Space in Early Islamic Arabia, uh, Cambridge University Press 2014. So thank you, and uh, I'll hand over to Phil to begin the set webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess, for the kind introduction and for the invitation for us all to um, be here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak to the members of the society, um, albeit digitally, um, and to have been invited by the Society and the Wolf Institute. And it's good to see some uh, familiar names in the participant list. So hello to all of you. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy what we have to say today. Um, I want to start by speaking a little bit about where my thinking is coming from um, in terms of the title and, and the, the ideas we're going to be speaking about today. You know, who, who should we be calling a pilgrim and who shouldn't we be calling a pilgrim? From my perspective, this originates from current debates in the history of Christian anthropology, um, where we have seen over the last few years anthropologists grappling with the usefulness of the term pilgrimage. Um, Eden Arbera in their book about international perspectives on pilgrimage uh, referred to the term as a catch-all type term that serves to translate a multipl multiplicity of meanings and nuances in other religious traditions, albeit it is a catch-all term which reflects the history of Christianity. So there are several problems in which um, several problems in using the term pilgrim or pilgrimage to refer to individuals who are traveling who are not necessarily from a Christian background. Um, but this is also the case um, when we consider the experiences and the descriptions of pilgrims before the early modern and into the before the modern and uh, in the medieval period. Um, the meanings of the word pilgrim and pilgrimage are far from uh, universal in this period. And it's not until, say, if we take the example of the French, until the 17th century that a definitive definition um, is arrived at, which, which links the words or the French words for pilgrim and pilgrimage um, with the idea that we might think of. Um, um, relating to pilgrimage today. The historians have done a very good job of charting the move um, in terms of terminology. If we think about the Latin term peregrinus and peregrinatio, which I'll be speaking about uh, mostly today, uh, we can see how in the late antique period, these terms were used to, to designate people in exile, strangers, foreigners. Um, and D. Dias has very um, clearly outlined the ways in which these understandings of the word peregrinus and peregrinatio morphed in the early Middle Ages to begin to describe things like life pilgrimage, as she terms it, before being applied more exclusively to what she terms place pilgrimage. Um, and we can see this move in the various kind of um, lives, the li ideas around life pilgrimage, linked to the various lives of the kind of itinerant early medieval saint, saintly people, people like Willibald who traveled across the medieval world um, to Jerusalem before returning to become the Bishop of Eichstadt in the eighth century. Um, but it's this idea of place pilgrimage, which we are more familiar with, the idea of an individual starting at one location, going to another location, usually a divine or sacred center, and returning having completed the journey. And that journey might be inspired for a range of reasons, health, um, search of miracles, um, penance, and, and various other factors. Um, the problem is, is that when we think about the terms peregrinus and peregrinatio, their use is far from universal and often very nuanced. And I think the key issue or the key problem that we encounter when we look at the period that we're discussing today of the kind of 11th through to 13th century um, is the issue of the Crusades. And the Crusades were very often referred to as pilgrimages. The Crusaders very often referred to as pilgrims. Um, the issue we have with the Crusaders is they're not, they didn't always behave like pilgrims or behave like one might behave on a pilgrimage as we'd usually expect. So what I want to do today uh, to kind of think about the problems related to the terminology in Latin of peregrinus and peregrinatio is to look at three um, pilgrimage accounts from the 12th to 13th century to think about the ways in which each of these pilgrims use the term peregrinus or peregrinatio and their derivatives and to see what that tells us about how we should understand um, Christian pilgrimage um, 
in the Middle Ages. And of course, Marcy and, and Harry after me will think about um, related issues um, connected with Jewish and Muslim pilgrimage. So the three pilgrims I'm going to talk about today, um, the first is Theodoric. He was a German um, pilgrim who traveled to the Holy Land in 1172. Um, he wrote an account of his pilgrimage, which is generally recognized as kind of a typical um, a typical pilgrimage account from that period. And um, he's, of course, traveling in the period when the Crusaders or the Latin um, Kingdom of Jerusalem uh, is in existence and when Jerusalem is controlled by Christians. Following this, we also have um, another German pilgrim known as Thietmar, who traveled between 1217 and 1218. Thietmar's account of his pilgrimage is a very, in many ways, atypical, um, as it uh, represents the first pilgrimage account from the Middle Ages uh, to speak about a visit to Mount Sinai, to the tomb of St. Catherine. And he also visits um, other disparate places, such as the monastic shrine of Sidonia, um, north of Damascus. Finally, the third pilgrim I'm going to consider today is Ricardo of Montecrosse. Um, he's a Florentine Dominican who traveled to the East between 1289 and 1300. Um, his travels began as a pilgrimage to Holland uh, and ended up with him spending several years in Baghdad um, as a missionary trying to convert um, the Mongols, Muslims and Eastern Christians who he encountered. So those are the three pilgrims. Um, their texts in total take up 186 pages of edited in, in edited collections. Um, within these 186 pages, there are only 27 times which these individuals use the terms peregrinus and peregrinatio, and only seven times in which they use it directly relating to themselves. I think in and of this self, this shows the problems we have in discussing pilgrimage and pilgrims um, in this period. Um, for nothing else than the fact that pilgrims very rarely, at least in this period, refer to themselves as pilgrims or their travels as pilgrimage. Um, if we take Theodoric to begin with, um, he makes no explicit link to himself and the term peregrinus or peregrinatio. The closest we get is when he's reporting the holy fire ceremony in Jerusalem, which he had the opportunity to participate in, uh, where he refers to himself as we poor with other pilgrims, cum alias peregrinus. Um, and that's the closest Theodoric gets to referring to himself specifically as a pilgrim. What we see in Theodoric's account is across the uses of, of the terms that they are usually applied to rituals. Um, i.e. the holy fire, um, the blessing of the water at the epiphany, on the epiphany at the Jordan, or to, to the practice of kind of pressing one's head into the hole where the cross um, was placed on Cal at Calvary. So the term peregrinus is often referred, related to rituals. It's also often related to the logistics, the guarding of pilgrims, the, um, the way pilgrims might travel or the pilgrim or pilgrim ships and so on and so forth. So they're kind of, in Theodoric's mind, related to a, a group as opposed to an individual. Um, Thietmar, on the other hand, is, uh, uses the term twice in rela relation to himself, um, but problematizes his use of peregrinus by also referring to himself as uh, crucis dominus signatus, so signed with the cross of the Lord, which we would usually associate with a description of a crusader. Um, Apart from these two references where he talks to, talks of himself as being as peregre, so the, using a verb form of the word to, to pilgrim, to be on pilgrimage, and talking of his companions as peregrinus meus. Um, the only other real reference that Thietmar gives to pilgrimage um, is in direct reference to um, Muslims on the Hajj, um, where he speaks of peregrini saraseni, um, visiting Muhammad's tomb. Um, and in this context, he speaks about how these individuals go on pilgrimage incorrectly, that, that you only get to go to Mecca if you pay the right amount. And then in that case, Christian pilgrimage is all about intent and Muslim pilgrimage is all about who can pay the most money. Um, so that's, that's Thietmar's use. So, so we do see some instances where he refers to himself as, as a pilgrim, but they are um, quite rare. The most interesting and the final one, which I'll speak about today, is the references to the terms in Ricardo's of Monte Crosse. Um, four of his references to pilgrimage actually relate to the life and ministry of Christ. He speaks about Christ's many pilgrimages. Um, he speaks about 
Mary's and Christ's travel to Egypt as a longer et laboriosa peregrinatio. Um, and he speaks in general about the movement of Christ from um, Nazareth, Bethlehem to um, Egypt as a peregrinatus. Um, so that's over half of his references to pilgrimage are related to Christ. A further two of his references are related to his times at the University of, we assume the University of Paris, where he is um, spent long and he had a long and laborious process of, of pilgrimage to learn the secular arts. So again, not directly um, a, a pilgrimage as we would understand it. Uh, and the final way in which he uses the word pilgrimage is in reference to his missionary um, exploits. So just after leaving Armenia and having spent a large portion of his text speaking about the Tatars, about the Mongols um, and various other peoples who one might encounter um, in the Middle East, he says, um, now we will continue with our pilgrimage. So interestingly, Ricardo refers to, uses the word pilgrimage in all of its times in almost abstract terms. He never really refers to his actual journey to the Holy Land as a pilgrimage. He refers to Christ's pilgrimage. He refers to the labor of secular learning as a pilgrimage. And he refers to his missionary work as a pilgrimage. But he doesn't actually refer to his pilgrimage as a pilgrimage. Um, so to wrap up my thoughts on this, what seems to be the case is that these three individuals, at least using these case studies, use the term pilgrimage when referring to either travel, to the actions performed by pilgrims, or to the intent of these individuals. I think the other thing to note is that these meanings in, the, in this period are multivalent. Pilgrimage can be used for multiple different, um, to describe multiple different things, and that these pilgrims understood this multivalence and deployed it to speak about pilgrimage in metaphorical um, in, in a metaphorical sense as much as they did in a literal sense. And I'll hand the time over now to Marcy. Okay, hello everybody. Um, is the audio okay now? Yeah, okay, Jess and Esther, Miriam, and everyone's nodding. Okay, excellent. Um, I do apologize for the lack of webcam. It does interfere with my audio for some bizarre reason. Um, so thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about Benjamin of Tudela and medieval Jewish pilgrimage. And I often think that Benjamin of Tudela actually needs no introduction um, because his name is so ubiquitous in the field of um, medieval pilgrimage and travel literature. And in fact, Benjamin of Tudela is often held up as the quintessential Jewish traveler. Um, in part, this is because his Sefer Masa'at, um, or the Book of Travels in English, is one of the most mind mind text for information about both the Jewish and non-Jewish worlds in the 12th century. Um, the narrative is written in Hebrew, um, some 80 pages, composed around the mid 12th century, and it details a journey from Spain across Mediterranean Europe to the Middle East, down to Egypt, um, and back across North Africa. The narrative also offers descriptions of India and the Far East, including China, and then also of Russia, Northern and Eastern Europe. Um, although for these sort of further afield places, scholars actually debate whether Benjamin visited these regions. Um, the text is not known for being particularly verbose and the majority of entries are actually confined to sort of the barest minimum of details. So the distance between destinations, whether um, the given location contained a Jewish community and if so, its size and the names of the um, primary leaders of that community. Dig a little deeper, however, and Benjamin of Tudela and his Masa'ot, it's actually quite a puzzle in reality, we know almost nothing about the person of Benjamin. So we do have um, an anonymously authored preface, which gives us his name, Benjamin Ben Yona, Benjamin, um, son of Yona, and states that he returned to Castile in 1173. Beyond this, scholars do not know the length of his journey, who he wrote his account for, nor why the journey was undertaken. In the absence of a stated purpose, 
scholars have used internal textual evidence to suggest a number of motivations for Benjamin of Tudela's travels, ranging from merchant to pilgrim to what I think is a very far-fetched um, potential for that of being a doctor. This scholarship has not necessarily been undertaken with critical rigor, and the theories that have been proposed remain largely unanalyzed, leaving them uncontested and perpetuated without further investigation. What remains is a number of hypotheses that scholars cannot definitively prove with adequate satisfaction. Now, I don't want to go through every single sort of motivation here um, to offer some sort of conclusive Benjamin of Stadella was this. But what I would like to explore is why the label pilgrim is one of the most enduring and whether or not it is even justified. Um, the great Jewish historian Cecil Roth remarked that Jews do not travel for dogmatic urge. There is no holy sepulchre to prostrate before to secure pardon for sins and no Kaaba in Mecca to visit at least once in a lifetime. Rather, argued Roth, Jews traveled for pure sentiment to see before they died the land of their fathers, the site where their temple once stood, the sepulchres of the ancient patriarchs and martyrs. Of course, when the Jewish temple did stand in Jerusalem, the Torah does command Jewish males to appear before God three times a year, at Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, known as the Shalosh Regalim, or the three foot festivals. After the, after the destruction of the temple, first in 8, 586 BCE, and then the second temple in 70 CE, this theological obligation of pilgrimage ceased. What you do begin to see is that from the fourth century onwards, there was a resurgence in Jewish travel to the Holy Land. The 12th century in particular saw a rise in frequent and continuous travel to the Holy Land amongst Jews. The famous Cairo Geniza reveals that pilgrimage was widespread in Jewish society in the medieval Islamic world. And so although these journeys were no longer a theological requirement, individual pilgrimages were certainly not outside the bounds of normative Judaism. Medieval Jewish pilgrimage can thus be characterized as more of an individual spiritual accomplishment. And whilst Jerusalem was always the ultimate destination for medieval Jewish travelers, travelers, they also began to visit other biblical sites, including Hebron and the Mount of Olives, as well as the tombs of biblical figures, such as prophets and kings, and the graves of Talmudic sages, particularly in um, the Northern Galilee. So returning to Benjamin, en route to the Holy Land, Sefer Masa'at makes notes of other pilgrimage activity, such as at um, Saint-Gilles in France, which is one of the first stops on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. Um, he mentions the Lateran Palace in Rome, as well as it's the city's numerous churches, the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Mecca, as well as Mosques in Damascus, and finally the Holy Sepulchre itself in Jerusalem. Mention is also made of some of the major pilgrimage ports in the Mediterranean. For instance, both Trani and Messina where pilgrims gathered to travel to Jerusalem. Um, and then of course, Acre, the main port which received the pilgrims into the Holy Land. But Benjamin of Tudela gives no indication that he himself made use of any of these ports as a pilgrim, merely offering up the observation. Once in the Holy Land and more broadly throughout the Levant, the Masa'at enumerates the many Jewish sacred sites to be found. Unsurprisingly, Jerusalem is one of the longest descriptions in the Masa'at. On the actual site of the destroyed ancient Jewish temple, the Masa'at states, in front of the Templum Domini is the Western Wall, which is one of the walls of the Holy of Holies. This is called the Gate of Mercy and all the Jews come to pray before the wall of the court of the temple. In this briefest of entries about one of the holiest sites in Judaism, the reader learns that Jews, whether foreign or otherwise, have a tradition of praying at the Western Wall. Nonetheless, there is no indication of Benjamin of Tudela's participation in any prayer-like activity. Moving further south at Hebron, the narrative relates that the tombs on display at the cave of the patriarchs are actually fake um, and have been placed there by the Gentiles. For Jews to see the real tombs of the forefathers, the text informs readers that they must bribe the guards. The travelogue goes on to describe in great detail the tombs that are found in the caves underneath. 
And here, unlike the example of Jerusalem, the Masat does not offer what types of devotional activities medieval Jews undertook when visiting the cave of the patriarchs, beyond perhaps a general desire to see the tombs. Whether as a place of prayer or simply a sacred space for Jews to connect to the biblical past, Benjamin of Tudela is once again silent about his own activities there, bribery or otherwise. The Mosa'at also includes sacred sites which are holy to and shared by Jews and Muslims. At the tomb of Ezekiel and the synagogue of Ezra, the text records that both Jews and Muslims come to pray at these holy sites. And so again, we see that there's this recognition of what one might call pilgrimage activity. Um, so the reader is once again presented with what others are doing at these sites, but never whether Benjamin of Tudela himself is partaking. There is no doubt that the Masa'at takes an interest in the sacred sites, not only of the Jews, but also of Christians and Muslims. The prominence given to sacred space in the Masa'at, including the lengthy description of Jerusalem, is evidence to suggest that Benjamin of Judela was a pilgrim. I would, however, hesitate, caution, perhaps, um, to categorically label the Sefer Masa'at as a pilgrimage account. Overall, the tone is that of a detached observer. Benjamin of Tudela does not appear to identify with the devotional activities that he records, nor gives any indication that a particular sacred site was, was included as part of a pilgrimage. Since a personal authorial voice is so wholly absent from the travelogue, the reader is in fact unable to deduce what religious rituals Benjamin himself may or may not have performed at these sacred sites. It may very well be that for the Tudelin, it was sufficient to be in the presence of such holiness without the need to, partake, without the need to pray or partake in any sort of prescribed ritual, let alone record his personal devotions for others to perhaps read in future. So what we do have, um, sort of taking the sum in the parts in total, um, is an account that includes sacred spaces, but whether they were recorded out of genuine piety, a simple desire to record the sacred Jewish landscape, especially that of the, of the biblical past, or out of mere intellectual curiosity remains unknown. And so without a clear understanding of Benjamin of Tudela's intentions, his personal religiosity, piety, call it what you will, um, I would actually sort of argue that to label him a pilgrim can really only be speculative. Um, so thank you very much, and I will turn over to Harry. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'd just like to um, uh, give my own thanks as well for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Um, I'm going to be speaking uh, just a little bit about, um, well, a particular view on um, Islamic pilgrimage practices. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about a figure called Ibn Taymiyyah, who was personally quite opposed to a very large number of practices that we would consider pilgrimage. Um, and and hope thereby to shine, uh, well, to at least think about, raise some issues of discussion um, that uh, correlate with some of the things Phil mentioned at the start of his talk about whether pilgrimage is useful as a catch-all term, um, about uh, the ways in which we might think about the term when it's applied to non uh, to non Christian practices, uh, and also actually uh, I'll think a little bit about the element of journey and whether journey is always considered necessary as part of a pilgrimage or even uh, or even uh, desirable. Um, so uh, the term pilgrimage in the Islamic context tends to be used to cover a variety of different practices, uh, most commonly uh, those labelled as Hajj and Umrah, and then also Ziyara. Um, hajj and Umrah are very specific terms. They refer to specific rites that take place at very particular places in and around Mecca, and uh, in the case of the Hajj at very specific times. The term Ziyara refers to almost anything else that we might label pilgrimage. It, it basically means to visit. Um, there are many such uh, ziyara, ziyarats discussed and practiced in different times at different places. Uh, I'm going to focus particularly on thoughts about pilgrimage to Jerusalem in this, uh, in this brief talk. Now, um, I'm going to talk a lot about contested ideas about uh, Jerusalem as a pilgrimage destination. I think it's worth emphasizing before I get going that Jerusalem, uh, pilgrimage practice involving Jerusalem were popular, uh, albeit contested in the pre-modern Islamic world. Um, there are loads of examples I could give, but just one because it goes on to be quite important. 
in the talk as it goes on. Um, by the by about well certainly by the eighth century, um, a hadith was in circulation um, in which the prophet Muhammad was held to have said, "quote You shall only set out on pilgrimage for three mosques: the sacred mosque, so that's in Mecca, my mosque in Medina, and the Aqsa mosque in Jerusalem." Now, this is an important hadith that's used often to justify pilgrimage uh, to these places, but it's also quite important uh, for those who oppose pilgrimage practices to a wide variety of places as well. So bear that in mind. Um, to be honest, over the early Islamic centuries, we have relatively little precise information about specific pilgrimages or practices involving Jerusalem, though I think we can assume that there were Muslim pilgrims. To that city. Uh, by the 11th century CE, however, we have very clear evidence for such pilgrimage practices. Um, a writer in the first half of the 11th century called Ibn al-Murajjah uh, wrote a guide to pilgrims uh, listing the sites around Jerusalem that they should see and the supplications that they should, uh, should offer at these different sites. So we do know that there, there's plenty of information out there um, by the sort of early, early to mid 11th century, uh, helping people think about how to perform pilgrimages to Jerusalem. So with that background, I'm going to move on to talk about uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Um, he's a, a very famous figure. Uh, many of you probably know him well. Uh, he was born in the 1260s in Haran in southeastern Turkey, uh, but he spent most of his life in Damascus. He was a highly controversial figure in his own day uh, and is well known for his opposition to a whole range of contemporary religious practices. A fairly recent assessment by Ovamir Anjum has suggested that these controversies resulted from his efforts to offer nothing short of, quote, a total critique of the contemporary Muslim society. Um, this controversy got him in trouble with the law. Uh, he, said he spent several stints in prison in both Damascus and Cairo. He eventually died in prison in Damascus in 1328. As I said, he opposed a very wide range of contemporary religious practices. He wrote dozens of treatises, hundreds of fatwas on a range of topics. Um, I'm just gonna focus here on one in which he goes into the most detail about his thoughts on Jerusalem pilgrimage practices. Um, uh, he, he, he goes on, many of his works cover the same, cover this sort of material as well, but this is the text that sort of gives his, gives his opinions in, in clearest format and most detail. Um, this particular fatwa isn't dated. Um, it's generally assumed, though only an assumption, it was, uh, it was composed, compiled in 1316. Um, it's divided into seven sections that cover a wide range of material and seek to justify opposition to most Jerusalem pilgrimages from various different angles. Um, I don't have time to cover them all here, but if it's possible to summarise his argument briefly, it might be this. Uh, that three mosques hadith, as I mentioned at the start, defines what is permissible. So absolutely everything else is forbidden. Um, so Hajj and Umrah are of course fine and travel to those three mosques specifically for a legitimate act of worship is fine, but nothing else is. Everything else is forbidden, an unwelcome innovation that cannot be considered a legitimate act. He especially singles out visits to places that aren't one of those three mosques, um, which he considers uh, reprehensible. This includes almost all sites in Jerusalem. He takes a very restrictive uh, interpretation of that hadith to mean that he thinks only the, the building, the specific building called the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem is, is a permissible destination. And he also condemns rites that are not what he uh, would call, I guess, quote unquote, normal acts of Muslim worship. So um, things other than prayer or reciting the Quran, something like that is, is not, is not, uh, not good. Um, now this level of opposition to pilgrimage practices was a bit unusual by his own day. And this is true amongst both scholars and other elites in his contemporary society who tended to have a more favorable uh, view of most of these pilgrimage practices and indeed try to uh, associate themselves with them to bolster their authority or profit from them in some other way. Um, there's lots that comes out of this document. I just think for today's discussion, it's worth highlighting two, uh, two aspects. First of all, uh, basically what are the perennial question, what is a pilgrimage? Um, more specifically in this case, is it a journey? Does it have to involve a journey or is it a set of rites and rituals? So in some senses, it's all about the rituals, the rites. And it is strictly speaking, of course, these that define a Hajj or Umrah. Um, so a Meccan can perform a Hajj, obviously, without traveling to, without having to travel from afar to Mecca. And for anyone else visiting from further afield, the Hajj or the Umrah only begins once the relevant rites have begun at Mecca or around Mecca. Uh, this is true to some extent for Ibn Taymiyyah, his assertion that only legitimate, what he calls legitimate rites can be performed at particular places is important to him. But in other ways, it's his discussion of journeying that actually seems most important. Um, journeying basically always, almost always seems bad. 
Um, so um, he, this, that, that hadith I mentioned, you should only set out on pilgrimage for three mosques. He uses that to essentially explain that you shouldn't be traveling to anywhere other than those three mosques. So he actually gives a very specific example of Medina and a, a, there's a lot of sites in and around Medina associated with, uh, with the prophet's career. And he argues it's perfectly okay for Medinans to go and pray in them but nobody else should be traveling from afar to go and pray in them. So for him, the journey sort of comes across um, as, a fairly, as a fairly negative aspect. The second uh, and final uh, point I want to make that sort of links into our discussion today is this question of essentially, uh, you know, is pilgrimage a term that we can apply for different traditions and the idea of shared practices among different communities around the Mediterranean and Islamic world. Now, for Ibn Taymiyyah, this comes across uh, through his frequent concern uh, that many practices performed by uh, Muslim pilgrims in Jerusalem and other places were mere imitations of what Christians and Jews got up to. So he gives some specific examples uh, for Jerusalem, uh, venerating the rock, uh, recognizing a footprint supposedly of the prophets or even according to some gods on the rock, venerating the site known as Jesus's cradle, visiting churches in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and others as well. Um, now, this concern that certain practices are imitations of Jewish and Christian practices it is shared by some other scholars uh, uh, as well. Um, but Ibn Taymiyyah makes quite a lot of this in his, uh, in his work, on pil in his various discussions of pilgrimage practices. If we can forget for a moment his concern about what he thought of as undue Jewish and Christian influence on poorly educated Muslims and their practices, it's perhaps worth remembering that he probably wasn't wrong to see a world of interactions, shared ideas and practices that emerged and developed amongst Jews, Christians and Muslims around the Mediterranean. They did presumably sort of bump into each other from time to time. Um, and it's hard to understand quite a lot of uh, discussions about pilgrimage practices in Muslim texts without thinking of that wider context. Uh, sometimes this is exceptionally clear. I mentioned the early 11th century um, pilgrimage guide to Jerusalem earlier. Uh, one of the supplications offered in that text, uh, it must be at the, it must be at the Mihrab Daoud, uh, in a site, a site in Jerusalem, um, it, the author says he took it from one of the Psalms. Uh, so you can see very, um, very explicit indications of this. Um, so it, I guess just to end, um, those of us, when we work on early Islamic history, we often think about the emergence of early Islamic texts in a, in a to use a term popularized by Wandsborough in the 70s, in the sectarian milieu. Uh, this idea that uh, ideas and doctrines developed amongst all these different religious communities in conversation with one another. And such a sort of context, of course, didn't disappear after the early Islamic centuries. There are many contexts of work behind anyone's views, including Ibn Taymiyyah's on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But one of those contexts was the meeting of local and more global perspectives on doctrines and practices, uh, a meeting that we assume Syria, Palestine, Jerusalem witnessed just as much as other places across the Islamic and Mediterranean worlds. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Marcy, for really interesting presentations. Just want to encourage the audience to please put your questions in the Q&A, which is down the bottom of your screen so that we can um, put them to the panel. Uh, we're starting to get some questions in, so I will uh, read the one of these, one for Marcy from William Griffiths. He said, you've told us how the Torah command to make three pilgrimages ceased with the destruction of the temple, and also about the lack of definite pilgrim activity language in Benjamin's accounts. He's wondering whether some light can be shed by a much later writer, Abraham Heschel, 1907 to 72, who was once asked where were the great cathedrals of the Jewish tradition and he's said to have replied the sabbath days are great cathedrals. Oh that's a really fascinating quote thank you so much for that. Um, yeah I mean I guess what one can say based on that quote is that after the after the destruction of even the first temple um, a lot of Jewish practice had to shift away from sort of the rituals and sacrifices. And so that's where sort of synagogue communal life took root, um, which we then particularly saw after the destruction of the second, second temple in 70 CE, where again, this shift away from the sacrifices, the central node. Um, and so I think that that quote really does sum up how the mentality was forced to shift away um, from the sort of cult-like status um, into 
Oh, I think we've just lost Marcy's voice as well as her video. Are you there? Because of oh, that. there you are. Yeah, sorry. No, no, just <laughs> say the last little bit again. Just about no, 20 just seconds. that. Sorry, just that because of the shift, um, that for sure pilgrimage could have. I don't want to say fallen by the wayside, but again, this whole debate as to well, what is there to see, um, and this internal view, um, sort of into the community instead. So yeah, it's a great quote. I really like it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for everybody, really, uh, from Matthew Bennett. Given the materiality of the pilgrim experience in terms of place and objects venerated, what kind of criticisms may we find across the three faiths of the practice as idolatrous? I'll leave it up to you who wants to begin. Do you want to start, Harry? I think you've... Um, yeah, okay. Um, in... Um, So there is, so if I've answered the question correctly, there is um there is quite a lot of concern about the danger of uh, if you if you either perform practices incorrectly or if you perform bad practices, that you are you might well you know tip over into into idolatry, um, and uh, I suppose this is why for many uh, for many pre-modern Muslim scholars um, these practices I guess required uh, significant. Uh, regulation and perhaps uh you know not coincidentally in a way that helps boost these scholars own authority that muslims need constant reminders of what of how to perform these uh how to perform these rituals properly but yes they are they are quite concerned about about slipping over into into idolatry um the 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 history i mean in islamic text the history of the kaaba itself is a little bit intertwined with the history of idolatry as well in the way that uh, texts texts discuss uh, some some sort of historians of pre-Islamic religious practices, uh, early Muslim historians of pre-Islamic religious practices would talk about the idea of idolatry being when people took bits of the car bits away from the Kaaba to to their home to their home places and and sort of started to started to venerate them there. So this this sort of borderline between legitimacy and idolatry is always there. Yeah. I think the uh, I'll add to that the um, the description of the Hajj that Thietmar gives, and um, of course he's mistaken in assuming that people are visiting the tomb of Muhammad, which is I think a rather common trope um, because of course so many Christian pilgrimage locations are associated with a tomb, so there's kind of an assumption that well they must be also visiting a tomb, and who else's tomb would they be visiting but Muhammad's? But there's, it's interesting that the key kind of juxtaposes his understanding of people visiting Mecca with his understanding of people visiting the Holy Sepulchre, that the Christians do it with the right intent. And for Muslims, it's all about materiality and, and the physicality and giving money to, to make sure you can access these holy places. I think that's just more a general trend of medieval criticisms of, of Islam, that it's quite a physical, fleshy religion as opposed to spirit. Christianity, which should be a, a much purer one. Um, I think interestingly, Ricardo doesn't mention Islamic pilgrimage practice, although he's quite, um, as far as I, can, I remember, um, certainly not in the Liber Peregrinationis, um, although he is quite complimentary about some aspects of, of Islam. I think the interesting, other interesting thing is there's a description in Thietmar of a miracle, which he, I think, seems to suggest that he witnesses. Um, and it's of a, a Saracen woman who goes to Sidonia and she wants to get some of the oil, that the miraculous oil that comes, and she doesn't have um, anything to take that oil away from. Um, and he describes basically this woman filling the whole church with kind of screams and lamenting and crying, um, at the end of which the, the, the Virgin Mary intervenes um, because of her compassion, I think he says, not because of her compassion, not because of the merit of this woman, because she was a Saracen. So therefore, there is she has no merit. Um, and the Virgin Mary causes a, a flask of oil to appear in this woman's hand, at which point she stops screaming and, 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 and lamenting at the tomb and everyone goes back to their peaceful, um, um, what gets on with their days. I, I think it's interesting because I think, and Harry can correct me here, that that's one of the things that even to me, uh, 
criticizes that when people go to these tombs they they make these loud noises and they they do all this thing and i, I can't help but thinking that what Thietmar is 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 adding a miraculous spin to him an actual observance of of a, a muslim woman undertaking some sort of tiara at, at, at sadnaya i mean perhaps but it's interesting that he doesn't criticize in that instance her act of going to this this place in search of um a relic and the only thing he criticizes is that she she is she's a muslim um that's that's my thoughts on on that marcy did um, you have anything to add yeah i can totally jump in on the uh, jewish perspective so there's two sort of levels um going back to the question as to whether or not benjamin himself is a pilgrim um one of the things that i mentioned is that he does talk a lot about um the sage, the graves of the sages, particularly in the Galilee. So he's quite happy to point them out. Um, and one of the things that I do wonder, and again, this is just sort of speculation, is that he doesn't necessarily, he might not overtly want to talk about prayer at these tombs because there is a debate within Jewish law as to whether or not one should even be praying at these grave sites. Um, so there's this whole sort of discussion in the Talmud about is it idolatrous practice because really the only person you should ever be praying to is God versus if you are at a graveside, are you perhaps praying to the dead person? In which case you're sort of verging into this or merging into this idea of saints and sainthood um, and this idea of in, um, spiritual interference um, between the prayer and then somebody else taking your prayer out to God. So there's, of course, in the Talmud, there's those rabbis who are all for praying at graves um, and then others who are very much against it because of this fear of intercession and idolatry. Um, and then just picking up on what both Phil and Harry have been talking about in terms of views of others. Um, the Book of Travels is really interesting because the Masa'at, from when the account may or may not have been written in the 1160s, 1170s, to when we have the first manuscript, there's about a 200 year gap. Um, but what's really interesting is that across the manuscript tradition, the way that Christians are termed changes. So you have the Hebrew term to'im, which could be translated as the mistaken ones or those who are mistaken. Um, so the Muslims are just usually called Ishmaelim, so Ishmaelites, whereas depending on which Sefer Masa'at manuscript you're looking at, there is potentially this sort of um, dig at the Christians um, if you read the word to'im as the mistaken ones. So yeah, that's Benjamin for you. <laughs> Thank you. Just a quick follow up to this for Phil, for, again from Matthew Bennett. He said, so there's no self-examination by the Christian writers then? I can't say there's no self-examination. Um, there may be another text that I'm not as familiar with as the ones from the period I'm looking at. Um, I think the other thing to say is that focusing really on pilgrimage texts. Um, I think the things that the Christian pilgrims have to say about Islam in those texts is perhaps different to what they might say in polemical texts. And for example, Record of Monte Crosso, who wrote, um, um, he wrote another text called um, Contra Lega Saracenorum Against the Law of the Saracens, in which he kind of step by step tried to pick apart, um, in particular, the Quran. Um, and he wrote and another text which he wrote, um, which is basically a uh, him a let a series is is styled as a series of letters that he wrote to God, asking for an answer as to why God would let the Saracens be so successful in recapturing places like Acre and, and things in like that. Um, and there is a little bit more self self examination in in those texts in terms of Ricardo saying, well, look. Um, there, there are seven virtues um, that 
Muslims have um, seven things that they do well and there's things like arms and prayer and they say maybe we could be better at praying maybe we could you know be better at giving arms to the poor and things like that um, but I'm, I'm not sure that I've I, I personally haven't come across any instances where that same self-examination is kind of is is given about pilgrimage where Christian writers are saying well Muslims do pilgrimage better than us if that if that makes sense Thanks, Phil. A question for Marcy and Harry from George Greenier, who says, I tend to choose the phrase cultic imperative for early Jews needing to visit Jerusalem and for Muslims needing to visit Mecca and sporadically other sites. Is that accurate and useful? Do either of you? Um, sorry, I'll just, I'm just, um, I'm just, I'm just trying to think about what, uh, uh, how to understand cultic, a cultic imperative. Um, I suppose, I suppose, um, cultic imperative might might be accurate enough for many Muslims' opinions of the Hajj. Um, it is a it is a it is a set of rituals that uh, uh, many Muslims are encouraged to uh, to undertake if they can. Um, I don't know if it would be. Uh, well, it probably, I'm, I'm sure there are some ways in which it might be applicable to other pilgrimages as well, but I can't think of uh, I, I can't think of anything particularly obvious leaping off the top of my head uh, at the moment. Um, in that sense, uh, so it, I think in that sense it might be worth distinguishing um, pilgrimages like well, what we call pilgrimages like Hajj and Umrah, which have specific a sort of a specific cultic place, if you like, alongside other pilgrimages that don't have a specific sort of cultic place in in calendar or in space or time or anything like that. Thank you. Marcy? Yeah, I'm also not really sure how to understand cultic imperative. Um, I think I would, just off the top of my head, sort of apply it much more to ancient Judaism and like ancient Jewish pilgrimage practices when the ancient temple did sort of act as a cultic center. Um, whereas I'm not so sure if Jerusalem in the Middle Ages was necessarily that center. It was more of like that longing from afar and the, the few that who did get the chance to go. Um, not to mention that Jews were banned from Jerusalem so many different times throughout the um, Middle Ages. So I'm just not sure. It was always in their hearts for sure. And like, you know, the prayers to return and all that. But so I guess cultic center from that perspective, but I would at least how I'm understanding it now, I would say that perhaps that's much more pertinent to ancient Judaism. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Antonella Liuzzo Scorpo, who's asked, as we have considered, this is for everybody, by the way, as we have considered definitions of pilgrimage slash pilgrims appearing or not in sources from diverse traditions, I was wondering whether social status and gender played any role in shaping them and or in the sort of patterns in which they might appear. I'm going to start with a tentative. Um, I think the issue that we have is the the sort of source materials we're relying upon um, for analysing, in particular, Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Um, I th I don't think there's a and and uh, I suppose realistically, the majority of texts. Uh, Pilgrim accounts written by Christians to Holland are written by um, by men. Um, it's the Middle Ages has a lovely bookend where we start with Algeria and we end with Marjorie Kemp, but in the middle there's just a lot of blokes talking about pilgrimage, unfortunately. Um, so I think that that makes the gender question a bit difficult. I would I think point towards um, Anne Bailey wrote a really good article about um, gender and pilgrimage where she looked at kind of um, texts from Miracula um, in England and she used those as evidence for women going on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. I think if you go outside of this traditional genre of pilgrimage accounts you can find much more information about genre, about gender. Um, and again social status I think ecclesiastical clerical pilgrims are more likely to leave a pilgrim account or a guide. Um, lay pilgrims are more likely to leave charters and, and other evidence. Um, less so when you get to the later Middle Ages when you get the laity writing their own pilgrimage accounts, but certainly for this period, 
um, which I think makes it difficult to assess the extent to which gender and social status really plays a role. But my, my gut feeling is that if you look at the pilgrimage accounts, the answer would be it's all male clerics. But if you look under the surface, there's women, there's laity, there's people from all ranges of society going on pilgrimage, uh, Christian pilgrimage at this time. Harry or Marcy? Um, yeah, I think I, I suppose to reiterate the point in some ways, I think I think that Phil was making that um, social status, gender uh, entirely shape these discussions in 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 the in the in the worldview of the people who who have left the source materials um, about them, and they in that sense uh, they frame them. I, I guess I was just thinking of the although I can't. I haven't haven't been like checking the evidence while I've been thinking about it. Um, that whether uh, when it comes to pilgrimage practices that are uh, specifically condemned, um, maybe a bit more widely, um, a lot of them might perhaps be linked to uh, be linked more clearly to ideas um, about social status and different peoples of different social statuses or or performed by different genders, um, and that, that that might well play a role. But it's certainly there, of course, in the these these issues are certainly paramount in the in the worldviews of the people writing these texts. Great, thank you. So just before Marcy jumps in, um, we're going to end the Facebook live stream now. So thank you to our audience on Facebook. Um, the panelists have kindly agreed to stay for a bit longer to answer some more questions. So those of you who are in the webinar, please do stick around um, to hear the answers to those. But thank you to everyone who's watching on Facebook and stay safe and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>